Matthew 25, 14 through 29. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who was leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. To one he gave five valuable coins, and to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. He gave each servant according to that servant's ability. Then he left on his journey. After the man left, the servant who had five valuable coins took them and went to work doing business with them. He gained five more. In the same way, the one who had two valuable coins gained two more. But the servant who had received the one valuable coin dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five valuable coins came forward with five additional coins. He said, Master, you gave me five valuable coins. Look, I've gained five more. His master replied, Excellent. You are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. The second servant also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two valuable coins. Look, I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done. You are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. Now the one who had received one valuable coin came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. You harvest grain where you haven't sown. You gather crops where you haven't spread seed. So I was afraid, and I hid my valuable coin in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. His master replied, You evil and lazy servant, I, you knew that I harvest grain where I haven't sown, and that I gather crops where I haven't spread seed. In that case, you should have turned my money over to the bankers, so that when I returned, you could give me what belonged to me with interest. Therefore, Take from him the valuable coin and give it to the one who has ten coins. Those who have much will receive more, and they will have more than they need. But as for those who don't have much, even the little bit they have will be taken away from them. Much of scripture celebrates God's abundance. The Bible begins with the creation story, with God turning a formless void into day and night, sky and land, vegetation and living creatures of every kind, and blessing them to be fruitful and to multiply, all the while seeing that it was good. The stories of abundance continue throughout time. God's covenant with Abraham to make him the ancestor of a multitude of nations, and then daily manna for the Israelites when they are wandering in the wilderness. Time and time again, the psalmist sings of God's goodness in the world and reminds us to celebrate this abundance. And Jesus in the Gospels turns water into wine and multiplies loaves and fishes for many to eat. All of these stories and many more in one way or another, celebrate God's abundance. And yet we often live a story where we think there isn't enough. John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil Company, was asked at the height of his career by a reporter, Mr. Rockefeller, how much is enough? And he responded, just a little more than I have. See, most of us can relate to that, can't we? We think of having enough as always meaning just a little bit more than we have right now. 
We believe as we say to ourselves, I need more, more things, more money, more space, more time, more vacation, more of almost anything. We rarely stop to challenge that way of thinking, and that's too bad, because it takes away our ability to see God's abundance in our lives. We certainly not are, are not alone in this misperception. Many of the stories in the Bible echo a similar theme of not having enough. When we look at the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and find the disciples anxious about the scarcity of food, they nervously ask Jesus, what are we going to do with so many people? We don't have enough food. Should we send them away? Jesus says, how much food do we have? Well, you remember the little boy with the five loaves and the two fish? Well, Jesus gave thanks for that little amount of food. And in that moment of gratitude, there was enough for everyone. God's abundance rises out of what we so often see as not being enough. Mary Jo Letty, in her book, Radical Gratitude, challenges us to a new level of awareness, a new perspective on how much we have. She encourages us to realize that the very life a person has been given is enough to begin with. It's enough to go on. Did you catch that? The very life you have been given, the very life I have been given, it is enough to begin with. Instead of being consumed with a sense that we should always be more, we should be more caring, more successful, more loving, more talented. We can be sustained by the awareness that the gift of life is enough. Letty would give a challenge to say to yourself, I am enough just as I am. You and I, with all of our strengths and weaknesses, each one of us are enough to make a difference. So maybe you want to say with me, I am enough, just as I am. Well, once we've accepted that our gift of life is enough, she continues, we need to set some limits on the spirit of craving and dissatisfaction, which holds us captive and sometimes even powerless. So not only are we enough, but we have enough too. God's abundance given to us in the gift of life. I think today's gospel lesson also has something to say about God's abundance. Much like last week's short series of parables, this is also a parable about the kingdom of God. And in verse 1, it says, The um, kingdom of God is like a man who was leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. Five valuable coins, most translations call them talents. And so five talents were given to one, two talents were given to another, and one talent was given to a third. Do you know how much a talent represents? It's hard to hear that word for us today because we think of a talent more in terms of a special aptitude, a gift, or a skill, or an ability. But in the days of the gospel writers, a talent was a measure of money that was worth more than 15 years' wages for a laborer. So one talent alone may have been more than a typical worker's career span given different life expectancies at the time. Five talents would have been, like, without a doubt, a whole lot of money, unimaginable. One man's abundance was entrusted to others to care for while he went on a journey. This is like God's creation, entrusted in Genesis for us to care for. Now, today's parable has three servants, each receiving a different amount to care for. Five talents, two talents, and one talent. This teaching is also found in Luke chapter 19, but the details there are different. For Luke writes that 10 servants were given 10 pounds each. I think it's important not to get too wrapped up in that detail. 
our experiences do tell us that we don't always receive the same amount to work with, and we don't always reap the same amount of benefit for our work. The point here is that we are all given something to work with. And as Mary Jo Letty would say, the gift of our life is enough. It is what we have to start with. It's not our job to worry about what we don't have in life. It's our job to make the most of what we do have. Yes, it's our job to make the most of what we do have. And I think that's the important thing to remember from this parable. You see, it's not about how much or how little or how different the amount given each servant was. We know that by the man's response to their efforts. You see, in verse 21, the master returns to settle their accounts with them. And the servant who was given five talents had earned five more. The man responds, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, so I'll put you in charge of much. The same thing happens with the servant who was given two talents to care for. He had earned two more. Well done, good and faithful servant, said the master. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful for uh, over a little, and so I'll put you in charge of much. But then the servant who was given one talent comes forward. He says, Master, I was afraid. So I went and hid your talent in the ground. What, cries the master, you evil and lazy servant. Couldn't you at least have taken my money over to the bankers so that I would get a little interest on it? Then he instructs the servant to give the talent to the one who had cared better for what he had been given. It's our job to make the most of what we do have. It's our job to do something with what we have been given. The first two did that, and the third did not. And through this parable, we begin to see that there is accountability in the kingdom of God. We are held accountable for how we care for the talents we have been given. We are held accountable for the life we have been given. And sometimes that is a scary realization, isn't it? So what are we to do in these days, these uncertain times when we might be both scared and yet also want to be faithful and trustworthy? Remember, it is our job to do the most with what we've been given. That means we are called to use our gifts, to use the gift of our life and all that we've been given because that is what we've been entrusted with. Mary Schramm, in her book, Gifts of Grace, suggests five steps in recognizing and using your gifts, and I'd like to walk through these steps with you now. The first step is to discover your gifts. You always discover your gifts in relationship, she says. You rarely discover your gifts in isolation. You discover your gifts through your parents, through your teachers, your coaches, friends, colleagues, spouses, children, and sometimes even strangers. Other people help you to discover their gifts, your gifts. And I might add to Shram's position here by saying that I also believe God can reveal your gifts to you through prayer. The second step is to accept the gifts that God has given you. There is a level of maturity required here in learning to accept the gifts that God has given to you and not given to you. Keep a check on how jealous or envious you are of other people and their gifts. If you are jealous or envious, then you probably don't have a very good acceptance of the gifts that God has given to you. So accept the gifts God has uniquely given to you, your own unique blend of talents, aptitudes, abilities, and life experiences your whole sum of all of your resources, of all you've got, and use what you've been given, for it is enough. So the third step is to enjoy your God-given talents, to take pleasure in them, appreciate what God can do through your life. The fourth step is to mature or to develop these gifts. Like all gifts, they need to be put to work to be exercised, and to develop. Nothing becomes stronger without hard work and the investment of time and energy and yourself. 
Even the parable we read told about the servant who had received five talents. He went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. He didn't double his money by sitting around on the couch or burying his talents in the ground. The fifth step involves all of these steps, and that is to surrender all your gifts to God. It means to give all of your gifts to Jesus Christ, to his service and his mission in the world. Those first five talents plus the work of the servant is what yielded five more talents. The two talents plus the work of the second servant yielded two more talents. That one talent, though, was buried in the ground. The third servant didn't work with what he had received, and he yielded nothing. Not only that, but what he had been given was then taken away from him. I'm pretty sure that I've shared this story with you before, but I buried my talents in the ground before, and my accountability came on an Easter morning when I was sitting in the balcony of my church at the time. I was listening to a brass quartet that the choir director had hired for Easter Sunday. The Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and said as clear as could be, why aren't you volunteering your trumpet playing today for your church? You have the ability, it's the least you can do. So next year, that's what I did. For me, it was as simple as that. When there is a need that can be filled by an ability or a talent that I have been given, then because God has blessed me with it, then I do what needs to be done. And you can look around this church and indeed, our community, and our world, and see many such opportunities that you likely could help with. I think that when it comes right down to it, God has been generous with all of us. It's our own misguided perceptions that lead us down a misguided path and into thinking that we don't have enough or that we aren't enough. And that line of thinking, in turn, sometimes paralyzes us with fear so that we don't do anything with what we've been given. And sometimes, yes, we might just be a little lazy, too. All of these things keep us from being trustworthy and faithful with our talents. May we remember that our life and the gifts we have been given are exactly what we've been entrusted with. And it's our job to make the most of it. And in so doing, may we truly learn to live as good and faithful servants in the kingdom of God. Amen.